Principles of Macroeconomics, Chapter 6, The Macroeconomic Perspective, Professor Wagner. The outline of the topic, topics covered in this chapter, uh, measuring the size of the economy, GDP, nominal values to real values, GDP over time, comparing GDP among countries, how, do, how well GDP measures the well-being of society. One of the ways that people can see the health of a nation is basically seeing how people, average person in society is faring. Uh, during the Great Depression, obviously there were like a, it was about 25% unemployment. Uh, there was no money in the banks for the most part, and so these were extremely hard times. And then there are other times when some are doing well and others are not. So it's more difficult to ascertain how uh, the economy of a country is doing. Macro, macroeconomic goals, framework, and policies. Goals, economic growth, low unemployment, low inflation. Framework, aggregate demand uh, by aggregate supply. Keynesian model, neoclassical model policy tools, monetary pol policy, and fiscal policy. So this is just an overall chart of what macroeconomics uh, cover. GDP is the value of all the outputs and go of goods and services within a country within a given year, measures the size of a nation's overall economy. And so it could be measured by the total value number of what consumers purchase in the economy, or, you know, or total value of what the country produces. The question of who buys all of a country's production. Uh, basically, there are four main players in this. There's consumer spend, spending, business spending, government spending, and spending on net exports. You might want to remember this one for the test. The percentage of components of GDP on the demand side could be uh, sliced up like a pie and consumption was nearly 70 percent our imports were negative 14.5 percent which means we did not really consume very much from other countries at that point in time uh 11.8 export government spending was 17 18 percent and investment is about 17 <laughs> percent the components of the GDP on the demand side, you can take a look at it graphically over time. And if you look at the chart year by percentage, you can see how consumption has always been somewhat near the top. And governments, you know, tracks pretty well along uh, what we call private investment over the years, about the same percentage year over year. And then the percentage of GDP in terms of exports. And you'll notice during the same time period that exports and imports, they pretty well track each other. There's been more separation in the, uh, you know, the early 2000s as, uh, as compared to, let's say, in the 1970 time frame where it was pretty much a trade balance or a trade equilibrium. And so, once again, you'll see that these things hold true. Consumption is about two thirds. Best business investments about 15, and it'll you know vary a little bit. And then uh, government is about 20 percent. Once again, graph B shows how exports and imports you know, relate to each other. Uh, there was a period where our exports, very short period, actually exceeded our imports, certainly in the 60s, all the way up through about the mid-70s. Then the picture began to change, and the appetite for uh, foreign goods, you know, increased uh, incrementally. Examples of this is the American taste for German luxury cars, uh, other products that you know other people make that work is deemed exotic it could be a Louis Vuitton purse it could be any number of things but effectively we were over past 1975 we began to import more than we exported 
And then there was really a very large trade gap experienced in the 2000s, which still exists and we're trying to correct with tariffs, which we will get into later. Net export component, this is basically whether we have a trade balance or imbalance. So you would take the do dollar value of the exports and subtract the imports. So X minus M, that's the trade balance. The surplus is when the exports are larger than its imports, and that would be calculated as imports minus imports. Trade deficit, uh, just the other way, imports minus exports. It's when a country's imports exceeds its exports. This is a small formula that's used to measure GDP, and you'll notice that You'll see this pretty much in any textbook. You want to know this formula. C is consumption. You add investment, government spending, and then the trade balance, which would be your exports minus your imports. GDP measured by what is produced. It can be divided into five main parts. You might want to know these. That's durable goods, non-durable goods, services, structures, and inventories. Every market transaction most, must have both a buyer and a seller, so GDP must be the same whether measured by what's demanded or by what's produced. Percentage of components on the GDP side are of production. So you have structures of about 8% to durable goods. What are durable goods? Durable goods are goods that last more than a year which is 16%. Non-durable goods are goods that basically last less than a year. And that's about 13.5%. And then services make up 62.4%. You notice a change in inventories is not shown since it's typically less than 1% of GDP. This is a graph over time of the types of production that occur, measuring the GDP. And you'll notice over time, services have uh, steadily climbed from about less than 45% to somewhere just beneath 65%. So we've become more of a service economy. That's what that tells us. Non-durable goods, the manufacturer of those was 25%. Uh, in 1960 and we're now to a level of about 15 percent on the durable goods front we've got a little bit of a less of a decline where we've uh, been somewhere between 20 and 25 percent for about a 20 period stretch from 65 till about 1990 and then it started to dip downward where we were under well under 20 percent structures Similar type of path, it stayed pretty flat until fairly recent times. And so this gives you a picture of where the emphasis of production has taken place over time in the overall economy. This slide carries on the narrative that I've spoken of about non-durable goods. And so really what the slide is doing is a continuation of the discussion I gave on the previous. And in the process of trying to determine the numbers properly, there is a problem with double counting. So double final goods and services, the output used directly for consumption, investment, and government trade purposes versus intermediate goods. And so double counting is output kind of more than, you know, basically counts as kind of more than once as it travels through the stages of production. That's potential mistake in measuring GDP. GDP is the dollar value of all final goods and services produced in the economy in a year. I would definitely say no, no this one for sure. This slide, more glossary, you have the gross national product. And so that's what's included domestically and what's produced by domestic labor and business abroad in a year. And what they're talking about are companies that are multinationals, of which we have, have many. Net national product, which is the GMP, minus the value of depreciation. And depreciation is a process by which capital ages over time and therefore loses its value. 
also known as time value of money, that to be discussed in another class. And that the NNP could be further so divided into national income, so we could talk about that in terms of wages, profits, rent, and profit income. We could talk about two different kinds of values or valuations. You have the nominal value, and that's the economic statistic that's announced at the time, unadjusted for inflation. The real value is an economic statistic after it's been adjusted for inflation. The real value is the more important of the two. Nominal value of GDP from 1960 to 2010. And so you have the nominal G GDP in billions of dollars, which effectively uh, you could just knock the other zeros off and talk about it in terms of trillions of dollars. And you'll notice uh, it is a step, steady uprise up till about 2010, which is kind of interesting because in this time period was the Great Recession and still somehow or another our GDP numbers apparently haven't really shrunk very much at that point in time or there's a bit of a delay. Just a point to make. The GDP deflator is basically a way of talking about money or money spent in terms of the value of a dollar. So it's kind of a form of indexing. And you'll have the legend over here on the uh, y-axis that says GDP deflator 2005 equals 100. So basically everything is spoken of in terms of the buying power at 2005 or basically uh, that's 100. All right, the, the, it's a price index measuring the average prices of all goods and services in, including the economy. And of course, it's risen exponentially through 1960 to through 2010. And then there's such beast is called real GDP. So you take the nominal GDP calculation and you take the price index and divide that by 100 and that price index is the same as the GDP deflator. So basically they're basically ch adjusting the real GDP in terms of the value of money and the buying power in any given year that you want to use as a benchmark. This is an example calculating real GDP. So in 1960, this is the amount of money, the output, the GDP def, uh, deflator. And so you have 543.3 and 19.0 uh, divided by 100. So in terms of $2,005, this is the real GDP. So you'll notice that's quite a bit larger than this one about by about five. In 2005, the real GDP, because the real GDP is talk, spoken of in terms of the buying power of $2,005, um, is simply this calculator. There is no calculation. This is the number for 2005. In 2010, we take that number, and the, the index is 110. You take that. And so what you wind up doing is dividing this number by 11, and this would be the real GDP in terms of $2,005. The answer to the question is explained as in the previous slide. And here's a calculation on how they got there. So basically, 100 over 100 is 1. Nothing's changed once again. Real GDP, billions of $2,005 in 2005, a $2,005 is a $2,005. This chart tracks nominal and real GDP through 1960 to 2012. And you'll notice that the nominal GDP somehow or another is considerably less, has much more of an exponential curve to it then let's say the real GDP, which is slightly flatter, but it still indicates a path of growth because of the upward slope. There was a point in time somewhere around 2005 where 
the two met. Uh, I, I'm not really going to say that's particularly uh, uh, significant other, other than the two lines crossed there, but effectively the nominal started becoming more, more valued than the real over a period of time, and that's because of the index. The next question involves calculating real GDP growth rate. This is spoken of all the time, every quarter, by the Federal Reserve Bank. And so this is a great determinant of how vibrant the economy is. It's a key measure. It's on business news almost daily. And so how do we get the number? And so we go ahead and do the calculations as we did before. And they say, well, what was the real GDP growth rate from 1960 to 2010? So you'll take the 2010 real GDP, subtract the 1960, and divide that by the 1960 times 100, and that will be the percentage change. So they plug in the numbers, and the growth rate, from the growth in terms of the value from 1960 to 2010 the economy grew by 376%, and that's in real terms. Tracking real GDP over time, governments report it as an annualized rate, even if they uh, project it during a quarter. So when I'm analyzing, gro analyzing growth in a quarter to calculate a growth of real GDP for the quarter is multiplied times four when it is reported. You know, basically at that given point, that is the percentage of growth for a full year, and that changes throughout the year. Uh, recession is a significant decline in national output, and then a depression is especially lengthy and deep decline in national output. So it's a, basically a you know, depression is a recession on steroids. So the 2008 situation, uh, just met, barely missed becoming an actual depression by the mere fact that we had uh, economic tools in our tool bag via the Federal Reserve that helped us prevent that. This graph shows the uh, real GDP in billions of dollars, and we're going all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century to near present. 2016, and the real GDP in 2016 was about 16.7 trillion. But after adjusting to remove the effects of inflation, this is about a 20-fold increase in the production of goods and services since the beginning of the 20th century. More glossary peak during a business cycle; it's the highest pound point of output before a recession hits. Trough during a business cycle. It's the lowest point of output in a recession. A word about recessions, uh, typically as they're reported on TV, by the time you hear the fact that we are in a recession, uh, it usually takes six months of a decline in output for it to be deemed a recession. So by the time you heard about it, we've already been on the decline for six months. And then it's a matter of how long does it last thereafter. Usually, you are already you've already hit the trough and you're bouncing back out of it uh, several you know for several months after that and then it's over with. Business cycle is economies relatively short term movement in and out of recession, and so recessions you know are in fact a part of the business cycle. They occur periodically. Many are often precipitated by black swan events, black swan events being things like what we're experiencing right now with the coronavirus. Black swan means, you know, catastrophic event. It could be a war, it could be disease, it could be famine, it could be things that are happening on a global level that impact everyone's uh, economic picture because it impacts production. In comparing GDP amongst different countries, uh, we have to find a way to convert things to a common denominator using an exchange rate. So it's the value of price of one currency in terms of another currency, exchange rate. So an example would be comparing Brazil's GDP 
in 2013 of 14, 4 point trillion reals with the US GDP of 16 trillion for the same year. The exchange rate at that point in time was 2.157 reals per the dollar. So if you were to convert Brazil's GDP into US dollars, you would first have to convert, convert you know, to use a conversion of the the uh, reals into dollar rate. So the form is you know, right below. And so you take the 4.845 trillion reals and then you take the exchange rate, divide it by that. And so the, it's a 2.25 you know, trillion dollar GDP once the conversion is made. It's about eight times less than the US Another measure used very often in terms of talking about economic cycles, GDP per capita. So we talk about our output in terms of how many people we have. So basically you take the GDP and you divide it by the population. So you can take the 16.7 trillion and divide that somewhere with a number of about anywhere from 310 to 320 million, because I believe that's somewhat near the population right now and then that would give you a GDP per capita figure and why do people measure the GDP well it measures the well-being of, uh, of a society overall so they talk about the standard of living but it doesn't necessarily talk about people's happiness or well-being or and uh, the difference between G there is a difference between GDP and a standard of living GDP doesn't include leisure time, which is a quality of life issue, actual levels of environmental cleanliness or health and learning, production that is not exchanged in the market, level of inequality in society, and what technology and products are available. So GDP is really just raw numbers. It's about dollars and, uh, you know, what the measure of those dollars are in terms of an aggregate. Uh, does not take the intangibles into into account. End of chapter six.